Welcome everybody to Palestine 101. I'm uh, Judith Tucker. I'm a professor emerita from the Department of History here at Georgetown. And uh, I have, uh, my uh, field is um, the Arab world in the Ottoman period, but I've also been very interested in the 19th and 20th centuries as well. Um, and I am happy to have with me today, Anna Wessels, who will introduce herself. Yeah. Hi, I'm Anna. I just graduated from the Arab Studies program at CPAS. Um, I'm Palestinian American. I mostly focus on Palestinian narratives, literature, and knowledge production. I've also been involved in um, student activism related to Palestine and the struggle for justice in Palestine since I was an undergrad. Um, yeah, and I just want to thank you all for taking the time of your days to come and learn about Palestine and its history and to broaden your understanding of Palestine. Great. Great. Okay. So Anna has graciously agreed to be here to help facilitate um, this session. And this session is brought to you by the Georgetown Faculty and Staff for Justice in Palestine. We are actually sponsoring a week this week of sessions um, with the idea that we want to put Palestine on the agenda for this semester for people who are interested at Georgetown. And um, I, I'm speaking today. Uh, the format is going to be a presentation followed by questions, discussion. Um, and then uh, we have a, uh, tomorrow, we have Professor Mustafa Aksakal, who's going to be speaking about on Ottoman Palestine. On um, Thursday, Professor Elliot Kola from the Department of uh, Arabic and Islamic Studies. And then on Friday, Professor Rochelle Davis from the School of, from Arab Studies and the School of Foreign Service. So, you know, we're all doing something a little different. So you to feel free to come back and, but also to encourage others to join you. And I'll join Anna in thanking you for taking the time to come today to uh, think and talk about Palestine. So, um, you know, my talk is basically geared for people who uh, perhaps don't, have not read very much about Palestine. And I'm sure that people in the room have a variety of backgrounds. So you should feel free as, as we go along or certainly in the, in the discussion period to raise issues and make contributions of your own. Um, we have a, a list of resources, by the way. I don't know if all of you saw it as you walked in the room, but if you didn't, I think it's back there. It, it, you can find it on your way out the door. Um, it just is our, some of our suggestions for further reading that you could do or films you could watch and so forth. So, um, so we've been witnessing for many, many months now, closing, you know, getting close to almost a year, a level of carnage and destruction in Gaza that has really been, I think, really truly shocking for many of us. And what I'd like to do today is suggest ways in which we might place this current moment in historical context. So this is gonna be a presentation rather heavy on the history of Palestine, um, but I think it's very important to just take a step back and to think about um, the, the history that informs what is happening today. And it also, I think, can help us cut to what I think are some of the obfuscating myths that we often find in the discourse, certainly in this country. Um, one of them being that, you know, somehow this is a, a unresolvable conflict in the sense that people have been fighting each other forever and, um, it, there's really no easy solution. Uh, another myth, I think, is that it's a conflict between Jews and Muslims based on intolerance and race hatred. And a third myth, although I think there are many others that one could talk about, is that the Palestinians have been primarily responsible for, the, for this protracted conflict since they've been unwilling to accept Israel and make peace. And so I'm, I'm hoping we can discuss approaches to the history uh, uh, that cut through these myths and others 
and normalize in a way the study of Israel and Palestine, normalize it by placing it in sound historical context. Um, it's too often talked of, I think, as something that is very exceptional, that is uh, outside, stands outside of history. So I'm going to focus here, and the whole series is focusing actually primarily on Palestine and Palestinians, uh, with the understanding that, of course, the narrative of the Jewish trauma of the Holocaust and the founding of the state of Israel is a much more familiar part of the story, at least for most people uh, in this country. And um, of course, it's incontestable that Palestine, Palestinian history, certainly in the 20th and 21st centuries, has been entwined with the history of Zionism and with the state of Israel. <clears throat> So historians are very fond of pointing out that um, historical narratives are very contingent on the point of departure. You know, where do we begin the story? And so I want to set the scenes with a few remarks about Palestine of the 18th and 19th centuries when it was part of the Ottoman Empire. And of course, Prof Professor Oxacol will go into more depth on this subject uh, tomorrow. Um, but I do want to say something about the Ottoman period, because I think it does speak directly to this notion of primordial conflict. Um, so I'll start there, and then I then want to discuss the ways in which the First World War and its aftermath in the form of the British mandatory government of Palestine as an ethno-nationalist and imperial project really lies at the heart of current events. Um, in other words, it was really geopolitics, not animosities based on religious difference that put us off squarely on the path to today. And then I want to look briefly at the watershed moment of 1948, when the state of Israel was established, when the Palestinians, many Palestinians were expelled and Palestinian property was confiscated. The Palestinian Nakba, the experience that continues to shape Palestinian perceptions of Israeli intentions. And then finally, I'll venture to say a few things about this history um, and how it has continued to inform both Israel and Palestine. And I want to argue that the intersection of ethno-nationalist and imperialist projects uh, shapes this history right up to the present. So, and as I said before, many of the topics I'll touch on are gonna be developed in more depth by uh, later speakers. So this is a lot, a lot to cover, and uh, let me just say that there will be a lot that is neglected as well um, by necessity. So first, the Ottoman Empire. What was Palestine under the Ottoman Empire? I think it's important to start here because of this whole idea that Palestinians and Israelis are somehow locked in an age-old conflict. Um, and I think that notion that this conflict has gone on forever and is of a religious nature is really belied by the historical record. So the land that came to be known as Palestine was part of the Ottoman Empire for some 400 years, really from 1516 to 1918. And historians agree that this was a period for the most part of, uh, of peace in Palestine. The territory was divided into several administrative districts, um, which changed over time. Uh, and usually these districts were administered by local notables coming from the main urban areas of Nablus, Jerusalem, Janine, Hebron, and Akka. And in the late Ottoman period, which is what this map uh, um, represents, in the late Ottoman period, the territory was divided between administrations located in Jerusalem in the south and Nablus and Akka in the north. Now, who lived there? Uh, the population was mixed. It was primarily Arabic-speaking Muslims, but there were also Arabic-speaking Christians and Jews. Other kinds of distinction, I think, from, what, from the historical records suggest that it's really other kinds of distinctions that were important to social life. Um, distinctions of geography, the rural, rural versus urban people, distinctions of class, you know, we had elite officials, wealthy merchants, the urban working class, um, the farming peasants. 
And our knowledge of how people thought about themselves in this period is necessarily limited, but we do see traces of very strong attachments to one's family, to one's village, to one's city, to one's surrounding areas. And we also have evidence of very uh, robust economic networks that knit areas of Palestine together um, through relation, many relationships of production and of trade. So there were webs connecting Jerusalem, for example, to its hinterland. The agricultural surplus from a number of Palestinian villages was earmarked through religious endowments for the upkeep of religious and charitable institutions in Jerusalem. We have good records on this. Um, for example, the Haseki Sultan School, Mosque, and Soup Kitchen, uh, which was founded uh, in the 16th century by the Ottoman Sultan's consort and funded by revenues from a number of Palestinian villages. And this actually, the soup kitchen is still in use in the old city of Jerusalem today. Um, and some of my own research uh, has entailed the reading of Islamic court records from the cities of Nablus and Jerusalem in the 18th century. Um, and these records reflected the ways in which uh, people availed themselves of the courts to conduct business, to buy and sell property, and to sort out family affairs like marriage, divorce, inheritance. Um, and the picture that emerges if you look at these records, and a lot of people use the Islamic courts, their, their records are really voluminous. Um, the picture is one of a vital society that is engaged in the economic and social activities of everyday living. And the diversity of the population is also very striking, especially in Jerusalem. Oh, there's you know one feature of the court records. I mean, there are many Christians and Jews who are present in the records of the Islamic courts. They came to the Islamic courts. Now they had courts in their own communities, um, but the Islamic court was really the court of record for uh, business matters. Um, and also was sometimes used for personal reasons as well. Many business transactions, of course, crossed religious lines. So you know, Muslims did business with, with Jews or Christians and vice versa. Um, and uh, sometimes people would go to court because also there was some kind of personal advantage. For example, when a Christian or Jewish man wanted to divorce his wife, that was impossible for him in his community court and he would, could have recourse to the Islamic court to do so. So you didn't need to be Muslim to use the Islamic court, in other words, but you did need to be ready to abide by the rules of, the, of, of that court by Islamic law. Um, so the, the courts really reflect for us a very high level of interaction among the different peoples who lived in a city like Jerusalem. Um, I would say some there were some lines that were really never crossed. And one of those was marriage. I mean, if you look at marriage records, and this is true, not just for religion, but for, for class, uh, you will find that people married among their own uh, communities by and large. Um, but people of different backgrounds did live in, in neighborhoods together, they did work together, they did socialize together. And you know, this is just a Jerusalem street scene from, from late, late, late Ottoman times, about 1900. And you can see Muslims, Christians, Jews on the street here. Um, now, I don't want to paint a totally idyllic picture of what was going on during Ottoman times. Um, you know, the Ottomans were an Islamic empire, after all, and Muslims were privileged in many ways. I mean, Christians and Jews, for example, were required to pay some special taxes. And there also, from time to time, were, for example, sartorial regulations about who could wear what um, and, and so forth that were, uh, as I said, not not in, not consistently enforced, but uh, were not uh, you know, formed part of this history. But but the Ottomans were also a very religiously and ethnically diverse empire, and 
they benefited from allowing religious communities to conduct their own affairs and to run their own religious and social institutions. Um, and religious identity was not a bar to high position in the empire. Well-placed Jews and Christians could be found holding official positions at court, for example. And I think overall, we have to ask ourselves, what, you know, what's missing? What's kind of missing here in this history of the Ottoman Empire? I mean, really what's missing is, uh, you know, what we think, what, what we know about Jewish, the history of the Jewish communities in Europe. I mean, there, there are, uh, you know, no systematic persecutions, no pogroms, no exclusions that constituted the, what came to be known as the Jewish question in Europe. So it's a different experience. Now there were changes afoot in the 19th century in that affected Palestine um, as they did the rest of the empire and the rest of the world. Um, the region was being integrated into a world economy and agriculture was increasingly commercialized. Land became more valuable and large landholders were able to get more control. And trade patterns were changing as European, as European demand for raw materials uh, led to expansion of the trade with Europe and the region and the growth of Mediterranean port cities, including those in Palestine like uh, Jaffa and Akka. And the land of Palestine also felt some very special pressures, some unique pressures, thanks to its connection to religious holy sites. Many Western pilgrims, our missionaries, diplomats traveled there as travel became uh, more accessible. Uh, there were Christian religious colonies set up in Palestine, set up by Germans, by Swedes, by Americans. And there was also an uptick in the number of Jewish immigrants in the second half of the 19th century. And they came for a number of reasons, the Jewish immigrants. Uh, some were religious European Jews coming to live in the Holy Land. Uh, some were North African Jews actually fleeing French uh, colonialism. Some were Yemeni Jews who had messianic visions. And there were a modest number in the late 19th century of politically motivated settlers from the nascent uh, Zionist movement in Europe. And so by the turn of the century, uh, the population of Palestine was about 700,000 to 750,000 people. 84% Muslim Arab, 11% Christian Arab, 5% Ottoman Jews, that's kind of local or, or sometimes called Arab Jews, local Jews, and a small number of foreign Jews. We don't really know exactly how many, but estimates are about 35,000. There was lots of mixing among these groups, particularly in a city like Jerusalem. Uh, tensions could arise, especially uh, between Christians and Jews actually around religious holidays, but there was also lots of shared space, uh, shared shrines, shared uh, and, and mutual dependence among these communities. And we don't find a, uh, we don't find much evidence of a, a pattern of, uh, you know, of very of disruptive animosities. And, and as I said before, Professor Oxacol is going to be examining the Ottoman period in greater depth tomorrow. Um, and uh, so I'm going to leave that to him and I'm going to move on to talk about the First World War and the British Mandate. Okay, so the First World War ushered in enormous changes, changes that are comprehensible to us, I think primarily in the context of the intersection of two major ideologies and concrete forces of the late 19th century. And those are ethno-nationalism and European imperialism. Ethno-nationalism as an ideology viewed ethnicity and ethnic ties as core components of the integrity and coherence of the modern nation. And it was very much a European concept in its conception. Uh, and uh, one that came, but it was one that came to be adopted by some groups some groups in the Ottoman Empire. And uh, there was the beginning of contesting visions of the inclusive Ottoman multi-ethnic empire in favor of more particularistic nationalist identities. And of course, the best known of these is probably the Greek nationalism, the earliest iteration 
um, of an ethno-nationalism that led to a breakaway uh, nation, a breakaway independence movement within the Ottoman Empire. Now in Palestine, we can see the emergence of currents of Arab distinctiveness in particular in the later 19th century, when there comes to be a focus on Arabic uh, as the language of Islam and also special Arab connections with uh, not just the glories of Islam, but the glories of the history of the region. And Arab distinctiveness was actually popular among Christians as well. Uh, Christian and Muslim intellectuals focused on Arabness in their literary activities, their newspapers, and we see something of a cultural renaissance in Palestine and in the wider region um, of uh, the what, what is called the Nahda that sowed the seeds of Arab consciousness. And also, we also see an emerging sense of a local Palestinian identity as well. Still, there were limits in this period, and probably most of the elite in Palestine were in fact good Ottomans and remained quite loyal to the empire until rather late in the game when Turkish ethno-nationalism threatened to exclude them. Now, Zionism was another ethnic nationalism and one that had a huge impact, of course, on the history of modern Palestine. The idea of some kind of actual physical return to Palestine for Jews is a modern idea and is part of the currents of political thought of 19th century Europe. Um, it first arose among Jews in the Russian Empire. The first Zionists were connected to Russian revolutionary movements in the 1860s and 1870s. Um, it was not the dominant trend by any means, dominant political trend in among Jewish communities, um, but it did uh, gain some adherence. And Zionists came to think that Jews needed a uniquely Jewish form of emancipation. The first articulation of the idea of colonization of Palestine arises among these uh, Russian Zionists. And the Zionists actually established a few agricultural collectives in Palestine in the 1880s and 1890s um, and sought to uh, regenerate the Jewish community through uh, primarily through this kind of settlement in agricultural labor. Political Zionism, as we know it today, uh, emerged clearly in the late 19th century. Uh, political Zionism was founded by uh, a, a man by the name of Theodore Herzl, familiar to many of you, I'm sure. And uh, at the... Uh, uh, the Basel Congress of 1897. And this is the program that was floated at that conference. The idea was to settle European Jewry as an autonomous society in Palestine on the basis that assimilation into European society had failed. Political Zionists were dedicated to using diplomatic means to seek the support of European states and the Ottomans for their project. Um, now, unlike Turkish and Arab nationalisms, of course, most of this nation, most of this potential Jewish nation was not already settled on chosen territory. So from the beginning, there was the problem posed by an indigenous population. And Herzl, among others, actually had initially had some reservations about Palestine because he understood that it was well populated and would entail displacement. Um, and so, you know, briefly, they thought about Argentina or Uganda, but reservations were overcome and the movement focused on Palestine and dealt with a somewhat, decided to deal with a somewhat wary Ottoman Empire. So before, before the First World War, the Zionist movement encouraged Jewish immigration from Europe and focused on buying as much land as possible from mainly large absentee landholders in Palestine. Um, and then when the land was bought, generally speaking, the Palestinian tenants were evicted. Um, they, the early Zionist community also did institute a policy of separation of the Zionist settler economy that excluded Arab labor 
and forbid sales of Jewish property to Arabs. Um, still, Zionism was not terribly successful prior to the First World War. Uh, so um, as you can see, uh, there is, uh, on the eve of the First World War, this, it was fairly, the, the movement of Jews to Palestine was fairly stagnant. There was not a great deal of interest and the total Jewish immigrants numbered about 35,000, as I've mentioned before. In addition, and then there was an additional number of indigenous Jews in Palestine. So um, if ethno-nationalism was one motor force, European imperialism was the other for political Zionism. And the, the French and British had economic and geostrategic interests in the Middle East that had grown enormously during the 19th century. They were interested in raw materials, cotton, silk, tobacco, and they had made significant financial investments. And the region was also a critical gateway to colonial possessions elsewhere. Now, during the First World War, France and Great Britain came to a secret agreement about how to divvy up Ottoman territory that they were anticipating would be, could become available in the wake of the Ottoman defeat. And this is the kind of notorious uh, Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916. Um, and it's clear that they intended to control the region. Palestine was supposed to be placed under international control, um, but as we will see, that is not exactly what happened. So in the following year of 1917, the, and this was a, the, the secret agreement between the French and the British. But then in the following year, 1917, we have the issuing of the Balfour Declaration, which was issued by the British Foreign Secretary at the time. And um, it was subsequently, the terms of this declaration are, would be subsequently incorporated into the British mandate that was established after the war under the auspices of the League of Nations. And here it is made it's being made clear that the Zionist project was seen as an imperial asset. And Balfour promised the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people, um, saying that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine. So Zionism as a form of Jewish ethnic nationalism becomes part of British colonial aims. This is generally considered to be the moment in which it is clearly stated as such. On the Zionist side, the strategy is to accentuate the role of Jews in Palestine as representatives and allies of European civilization, a way to cultivate European support. And on the British side, colonial control of Palestine was thought to be enhanced by having strong allies in the Jewish community um, um, in Palestine itself. So, and on the Palestinian side, which we don't hear from a lot in the Western documents in this period, but there was growing concern that they were being completely sidelined, that their rights were not being taken into consideration. So as soon as the war ended, the First World War ended, Palestinian leaders did begin pushing for independence. Um, and Congresses were held, there were petitions drawn up and submitted to the peace conference. They were basically ignored. And after the defeat of Ottoman forces and the breakup of the empire, uh, European imperial powers rushed in to claim their shares, assert their influence and secure their interests in the region. And all of this was done without any reference to the wishes of the local population. Um, and there's one intriguing blip here, uh, which you may well have heard about, which was the King Crane Commission that was sent, an, an American-based commission that was uh, sponsored by President Woodrow Wilson to and sent to, to the region, Palestine and Syria, to ascertain the wishes of the local population. Um, and if this American group toured uh, Syria and Palestine and found, lo and behold, as you can see from this document, that the local population actually wanted an independent state and they were hostile to the Zionist plan for a Jewish state in Palestine. 
they actually toured around the country. They received delegations of various kinds. They listened to uh, representations from different communities. And this was their conclusion. And so they recommended actually curbing Zionist immigration, but they were ignored. And actually, America entered a time of relative isolationism and really never put any uh, through its uh, weight behind these recommendations. By the way, the, ar the archives, extensive archives of this King Crane Commission project are, um, are now digitized. They're housed at Oberlin College. They're digitized, and they are great material for uh, writing research papers, if anybody gets more interested in this somewhat understudied uh, moment. But of course, things didn't go the way the King Crane Commission uh, recommended at all. And the League of Nations placed Palestine under British rule and the terms of the British mandate. Uh, this is this was the initial, the map of the initial British mandate. And then it was after 1922, it's divided into Palestine and Transjordan. Um, the terms of the mandate included the granting of many privileges to the Zionist movement. And through the 1920s, the alliance of British colonialism and Zionism was really quite firm. Uh, the unofficial government of the Jewish community, the Jewish agency, had very good access to the British High Commissioner. And policies on land and immigration allowed the Jewish community to continue to acquire land and grow, despite many Palestinian petitions and protests in the period. And the same pattern of land acquisition tended to continue. It was mostly large uh, land purchases from large absentee landholders. And then these longstanding Palestinian tenants would be displaced. Uh, the Jewish agency had a very firm policy of not selling or renting land to Palestinians. And that resulted in permanent land loss. <clears throat> now, in the 1920s, the British and Zionist alliance grew somewhat rockier. Uh, the British ease of administration of Palestine was disturbed by growing tensions between Jewish and Palestinian communities. In 1929, there was a significant incident of communal violence in Jerusalem, and a British commission uh, that in, was investigating it recommended curbs on Jewish immigration. But that would, they were successfully opposed by the Zionist movement and its allies. And Palestinian dismay over the policy of the British occupiers that privileged the autonomy and growth of the Jewish community led to Palestinian resistance in the form of a major uprising in the years from 1936 to 1939, known as the Great Revolt. And uh, one of the main leaders was this man, Sheikh Zidin Hassan. Uh, it, it was initially a rural revolt, but expanded to urban areas as well. Here's another. <clears throat> um, the traditional elite of Palestinian leadership tried to assert control over this revolt, which is really more of a grassroots uprising, um, but they, were, they, they really weren't able to, to uh, totally take control. Um, uh, the Arab higher committee, uh, here's, oops, oh, sorry, here's a great revolt, a demonstration, sorry, it's a picture of a demonstration of great, in, during the great revolt uh, in an urban area. Um, the Arab higher committee, which was a kind of represented the Palestinian elite, uh, had, uh, was not really able to uh, assert their leadership. Um, and, uh, you know, there's an interesting sartorial note here. As you can see, this, these, uh, these men of the elite uh, generally wore, their headgear was the fez, um, much favored by the urban elite at the time. And during the revolt, it was basically the, the revolt was abandoned in favor of the kafia, which was a typical peasant headdress. And the partisans of the Arab revolt uh, chose to, rep, to, to present themselves um, it clad in the kafir. And that's still with us, interestingly, as a symbol of Palestinian resistance. So the revolt was suppressed by the British and um, they, they troops poured in, British troops poured in and there was really a quite brutal counterinsurgency campaign. 
Um, they used, the British used uh, assassinations, house demolitions, deportations, mass detentions without trial. And actually many of the uh, regulations, the laws and, and, and regulations they used are still on the books and still in use in Israel. Just a, a checkpoint, a British checkpoint. Um, however, the revolt did elicit a political response. And the British sent the Peel Commission, a, a new commission came out from Britain to investigate the causes of the revolt. Um, and it resulted in the very first proposal for a partition of the land of Palestine. Um, and this is what was proposed. Uh, the, the Jewish state would, in purple and the Palestinian state in green. Now, the Zionists thought the proposed Jewish state was too small, um, and so they rejected this idea. And the Palestinians, uh, they rejected the idea also, um, their proposal to allot their land to a Jewish state Felt they felt betrayed a long string of promises that had been made to them to the contrary, that this was not going to happen. So after 1939, the British did decide to limit Jewish immigration and withdraw their full-throated support for the Jewish state and their relations with the Zionists actually cooled somewhat. So, so let us turn briefly, to 1948 and the Nakba. So, you know, the eruption of virulent anti-Semitism in 1930s Europe and the full-blown persecution and program of annihilation in Nazi Germany produced a stream of Jewish refugees from Europe, both before and after World War II. And it did significantly increase the number of Jews in Palestine. And here we should note and passing that many Western countries did not allow Jews to, uh, to uh, enter their countries, um, uh, um, much to actually, much to their shame. So by 1947, the Jews constituted a third of the population of Palestine. So this was a, a kind of dramatic growth in the Jewish community. Um, and then after the war, a weakened British state was retreating from colonial possessions. And it turned the problem of Palestine over to the new United Nations in 1947. And a United Nations that was dominated by now by the United States and the Soviet Union. And the United Nations voted for partition. And this was the partition plan that the United Nations came up with uh, um, in 1947. The Again, the Palestinians saw the idea of partition as an assault on their basic rights to self-determination, and they were opposed. They also saw it as highly unfair in terms of land ownership and population patterns. So as I mentioned before, the Jews now constituted about a third of the population of Palestine, um, but they owned about 6% of the land. Um, this is a land distribution map with the Palestinian land holdings in green and the, um, the uh, Jewish land holdings in red. Um, and the Palestinians pointed out that under this partition plan, the Jewish state would contain about 56% of the land of Palestine, although ownership, they, ownership, the community only owned about 6% of the land. <clears throat> Another issue that Palestinians brought up about this partition plan was that there was um, uh, a population distribution issue. The Arabs were the majority population in all districts except for one. Um, and they would find themselves, if everybody just stayed put and the partition took place, the um, this would be the result. The uh, total population of the proposed Arab state uh, would be, uh, as you can see, would be 99% Arab, but Arabs would find themselves uh, in, in large numbers in the Jewish state. So the Arab state, as, 
as uh, the partition uh, assigned it would have 99% uh, Arabs, 10,000 Jews, only 1% Jewish population. But the Jewish state would, by necessity, have 45% Arabs and 55% Jews. And the Palestinians rejected this as outrageously unfair way of distributing the population. So there was conflict, and the ensuing conflict had two main stages. Uh, there was first intercommunal conflict, uh, and this is between the period from the time the UN votes in 1947 to establish, uh, to partition Palestine, up to the period, up to the moment of the British withdrawal from Palestine on May 15th, 1948. In that period, uh, Jewish forces try had a, uh, tried to consolidate their hold on the territory. There were um, very systematic uh, military campaigns involving armed attacks, uh, whispering campaigns, massacres, the blocking of any return to evacuated villages. And I mean, there was a plan in place, and now historians understand there was a plan Dalet, which was adopted in March 1948 by Zionist leaders. And um, it was a plan basically to try and, and, and remove or, remove Palestinians from the territory that was envisioned as part of the future Jewish state. And after the British withdrawal, um, then, uh, that's the British withdrawal, after the British withdrawal, uh, the, the conflict entered a new phase when Arab troops entered the war. We had troops coming in from Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, Transjordan, Iraq, um, and that was after Israel declared independence on May 15th, 1948. Now the Arab troops, all of them, put in a very poor performance actually, and were handily defeated by a much better armed and better trained Israeli military. And the outcome was that the Israeli state was able to expand its borders well beyond those envisioned in the UN plan. <clears throat> And here you can see what was envisioned in the plan in the light green and then the additional areas in the darker green. <clears throat> 700,000 refu Palestinian refugees more or less were driven out by military and terror operations and some 418 Palestinian villages were destroyed and generally raised to the ground. <clears throat> the, the war concluded with an armistice, but with no final peace treaty. Um, there was uh, Palestinian refugees uh, uh, under both, as you can see, moved in various directions. Um, <clears throat> there was actually, uh, Israel established new borders, but they were never really, never formalized. The borders were well beyond what had been envisioned in the plan. Um, Egypt came to administer the Gaza Strip. Jordan subsumed the West Bank. And the expelled Palestinians were not allowed to return uh, to the 48, uh, new 48 borders of Israel. So this is the Israeli War of Independence, which equals the Palestinian Nakba, or disaster. And uh, Zionism, as an ethno-nationalist movement, uh, did subject Palestinians to a prolonged status as a colonized people, and then to expulsion from their land and the frustration of their own self-determination. And 1948 also brought about profound social disruption as well, as families and communities were shattered. Um, and I think it was and is a conflict about, about land, about belonging, about self-determination, uh, not about religion as such. <clears throat> now, after the Nakba, imperial interests continued to deny Palestinian rights to self-determination. And although the United States has ha had initially maintained some distance from the new state of Israel, not always giving it blanket cover in the UN the way we see today, this began to change after the 1967 war 
when Israel increasingly came to be seen as a strong and reliable regional ally. <clears throat> the 67 war also allowed Israel to further expand its own national ambitions. Um, and uh, as I think, as you're all well aware, it, this was the moment in which the Israeli victory in the, when, in the war also meant the takeover of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and the imp imposition of military rule over large numbers of Palestinians. <clears throat> now, you know, I'm not really going to talk much about Palestinian, how Palestinians have resisted over time. They, they certainly have. I mean, there was a period of shock after the Nakba, but then the, there was gradually the formation of a more organized Palestinian resistance, not the least in the form of the Palestinian Palestine Liberation Organization, the PLO, founded initially in 1964, but increasingly active after the 1967 war, when Palestinians, I think, really gave up on the whole strategy of relying on Arab states and thought that they really needed to look to their own efforts. I mean, the PLO was an organization in exile for many, many years, first in Jordan and then in Lebanon and then in Tunisia. Um, but all the various groups had active underground branches in the West Bank and Gaza, which were illegal until after the signing of the Oslo Accords between Israeli and Palestinian leaders in 1993. And uh, we should note that the Palestinian resistance has routinely been characterized by the U.S. as terrorism. The PLO were terrorists uh, back in the day. Um, and thought not to be deserving of Western support. And when Palestinian leadership has made huge concessions, such as with the Oslo Accords, there really has been very little political will in this country to pressure Israel. Uh, so the tendency in the Western narrative to demonize Palestinians takes little account of this history of dispossession and frustrated ambitions and there is debate today about whether Israel can be viewed as a colonial state. Um, but in the historical context, I would argue that the Palestinians certainly look like a colonized people. So, so I'm just going to say a few words in conclusion, and we can move move to uh, some you know questions discussion. I'm, it's it's a very brief and potted history I have given but perhaps it can pinpoint some enduring issues that have never been resolved. Um, it's been very difficult for Israel to come to terms with the fact that its state is predicated upon dispossession. Many of observers of Israeli society remark upon the willful delusion that Palestinians don't really exist. And there's, there's a remark famously attributed to that effect to Golda Meir, the former prime minister of Israel, or that they really belong somewhere else in Jordan, you know, in Egypt with brother Arabs somehow, or that they got what they deserved because their resistance to Zionist colonization was part and parcel of the anti-Semitism of Europe. Um, and current Israeli rhetoric certainly picks up on these themes. Of course, secondly, as we're very well aware, the process of Zionist settlement of Palestine has not yet come to a close. Uh, we only have to look to the West Bank to understand that this is an ongoing project. There has been a steady expansion of settlements. The Oslo Accords signed in, um, sorry, that's, yeah. uh, the Oslo Accords signed in 1993 were supposed to lead to more permanent arrangement in five years um, with final status negotiations. But the temporary ABC zones of the Oslo Accords um, uh, were never revised and the negotiations stalled. You know, A was supposed to be under Palestinian administration and security, B under Israeli security control, under security control only, and B under complete Israeli administration and security control. So Oslo was supposed to lead to some form of a Palestinian state and nothing could seem more remote at the moment. The number of Jewish settlers in the West Bank has more than doubled since Oslo and continues to climb. And if we look at the pattern of settlements and the roads that are, have been con constructed in the West Bank that are restricted to settlers, 
um, you can see that the fragmentation that has resulted. And even as we speak, of course, there are very serious attacks taking place um, on Palestinian civilians in the West Bank by the Israeli military and, and by Israeli settlers. They, they have had their land taken, they've had their houses destroyed, and there has been um, many civilians who are killed. So the fact that there's been no real penalty internationally imposed for successful acts of ethnic cleansing uh, means that we probably have not seen the last of it. So I would like to raise the issue that, you know, in, in an exclusive ethnic nationalism like Zionism that has not defined its borders and that has a large indigenous population without rights does face dilemmas and unresolved issues. I mean, what do you do about the occupation of Palestinian lands and this resentful people? I mean, how do you run this state in a, post, in a supposedly post-colonial world? There is, of course, the apartheid option, and this is the restriction of a disenfranchised population to controlled areas, as in the construction of the wall separating Palestinians. Sorry, this is this is more the fragmentation. The wall separating Palestinians from, um, you know, often from their own lands, the restricting their movement. Um, and only Palestinians are affected by this, the, by the wall and by the, the restricted roads. Israelis can cross at will. There is also the euphemistically labeled transfer option, which means the expulsion of the indigenous population. And I think we really need to ask if this is the current plan for Palestinians in Gaza. It's certainly being entertained quite openly in some Israeli circles. And of course, it's an option that conjures up the Nakba of 48 for Palestinians, which has never been far from their minds. And of course, we have the, the disaster that is Gaza. Um, it has long been an overpopulated, impoverished, isolated enclave where the Palestinian population, 70% of whom are descendants of our refugees or descendants of refugees themselves, are. They are crowded together, they are effectively caged, and nothing and no one has been permitted in and out uh, by, it, except by Israel. And this has been the case for, for many years now. Um, and inevitable unrest in a place like Gaza can be capitalized on by various political forces, as we are well aware. This current attack, by the way, is the 10th is the since 2005, the 10th military bombardment since, since 2005, although of course it is by far, by far the most deadly. Um, and then of course there is the question of the 20% of the Israeli population, the Israeli population that holds Israeli passports, who are Palestinians, who are were still within the 48 boundaries of of um, Israel. Uh, is, is this a state for all its citizens? And how does having 20% of your population not holding uh, and not having equal rights fit with Israel as a Jewish state? And in July 2018, we saw the passage of what was called the nation state law in Israel, which basically said that the right to exercise national self-determination is, and I quote, unique to the Jewish people. Um, so, you know, at this moment, I mean, I think we're all concerned about just the immediate and also perhaps the long-term future also. There've been a number of peace plans over the years with global hegemons at the helm. They never seem to get anywhere. Whenever talk turns to what's called the final status issues, which are things like the refugees right to return, the status of Jerusalem, the problem of settlements and land grabs in the West Bank, there's been little to no progress and Israel has continued really to stall on negotiations. Um, and indeed, from the Palestinian point of view, this situation has only grown worse over time. And then just recently in July uh, of 2000, 24, the Israeli Knesset passed a resolution overwhelmingly, 68 to 9, 
that rejected the establishment of a Palestinian state. So the failure of the international community to stop what is happening in Gaza, and this is despite the fact that the International Court of Justice has made it very clear that this is a, a plausible genocide and that the Israeli occupation of Palestinian lands is contravenes international law. Despite all this, we see the you know, actions and inactions of our own government that are supporting this uh, ongoing uh, genocide in Gaza. And in many ways, a long continuation, a continuation of a long history of international involvement that has failed to achieve a settlement that would work for all parties. And um, it's also a failure of a Palestinian leadership that has uh, continued to look to Western powers and uh, for help um, for, with a just, for a just outcome. So not very upbeat. Uh, as an ending, but I, you know, I hope that at least, sorry, we, I, I fell down on uh, some of these. This is the wall. Okay. Um, yeah. So you know, let. I think we can just move along now, perhaps to you know, to questions, to discussion, to however you would like to proceed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess one thing I wanted to add on the Nakbe of 1948, I think one of the um, Zionist or Israeli historical narratives about their quote unquote war of independence is um, basically that they declared independence and Arab states, surrounding Arab states, attacked them and then it became a defensive thing. And I just wanted to, to note that before Israel declared independence in May of 1948, um, about somewhere between, I think, 200,000 and 300,000 Palestinians had already been expelled from their homes and like entire cities had already been depopulated. So I just wanted to talk about, yeah, just bring that up as like, it was a very concerted plan of getting as many um, Palestinians, or moving as many Palestinians off of as much uh, land as possible. And yeah. Can we open up the, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I'm Zaini, I'm Jordan. Uh, okay. Just I want to mention that uh, uh, regarding to the war uh, after 1948, because the Arab refused the divided Palestine between yeah. Jewish and Arab, uh, the Arab army, it's, it was under the supervision and under the leader of British, wow. expecting they would lose the war, you know. Uh, all the Arab countries in this time, they are not free. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank well, you. But thanks for the they will not report. Yeah. Thank you. So that's that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, please go ahead. I had a question about this sense of like Palestinian national identity before 1948. Mm -hmm. So this is across, you know, West Asia. The national identities of the region that exist today are not given and most of them are formed in the context of the structures of organizations like socially and politically that were imposed or created after world war one and so you wouldn't have new york identity or senior identity without the borders that first you know gave them the the like the the kind of like the place to be in where it exists so that in palestine prior to 1948 was there like a sense of a Palestinian like existence apart from let's say like a Syrian like broadly larger Syrian existence or Arab existence or was that still nascent and not really a thing? Yeah, I think um, uh, you know of course these things emerge gradually, but I mean Palestine as as Palestine, Palestine of the British Mandate. That's when the boundaries got drawn of modern day Palestine. You can say is is you know, in the mandate by the British uh, as a mandate. But having said that, I mean, one can, it, and, and then I, I think identity was emer emerged gradually over time as a, as a result. Um, but I think you can say, I mean, for people who study Palestinian history, you know, there, there are clearly, you know, as I said, attachments to, to place, right? And that place can be, you know, it's your village, it's your region, it's your city, it's your, and, and there were many, many connections um, 
Actually, the, probably the one of the best studies of this is Bashara Dumani's uh, study of what was the title of the book? Remember, uh, Palestine. Read, thank you, thank you, Rediscovering Palestine, which really looks at this, uh, you know, Palestine before the British mandate, I mean, in the 18th and early 19th centuries, and basically traces this whole network of trade and family relationships that knit this area together. It doesn't mean that people were saying, you know, I'm a proud Palestinian, because it wasn't a Palestinian identity of that, national identity of that kind as of yet, but there was certainly a sense of um, <clears throat> attachment to place and uh, identification with a certain community that was lived on in that place. Um, so, yeah, I mean, but I, I think, you know, it does, it definitely predates 48 because the Palestinians all during the British mandate period, Palestinians are, uh, you know, speaking up for themselves and agitating and saying, you know, we want, we want our independence. We want our self-determination. We want, you know, this is our right, um, but you know. Can I just add a footnote to that? Please. Uh, please. Just sort of an illustration. One of the very first uh, newspapers after the um, after the press freedom after 1908, the censorship was list, list, listed. Uh, one of the main papers in the Philistine, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So clearly, there's also a, a, a adherence to that designation. That is right. Mm -hmm. Yes, I could just also to add to this, um, that the fact that I think identity is like a, like a, I think a, restri a very restricted concept for us to think about that time and place, but anti-colonial, that form of like formation and community formation perhaps is like what could describe this the best. And I think um, in a way that could see across those borders that we see today, right? So like even, because Syria was not just Syria. So like in a sense, it wasn't Palestine is like the way we think about it today, right? Like I just, like I often think of this as anti-colonial and like just, it's more of like determination. And, and I think today we're really trapped to think determination means state, right? Like in a way, that's mm -hmm. just one way where it can find, but yeah, mm -hmm. just to share. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I just a before the question, I would recommend reading um Dr. Foster. He tried to find where where can we find the first Palestinian. Which mm -hmm. he opens up uh, his book on his great great uncle who corresponded with um Herzl. There was evidence of Palestinian. Um and so yeah, Dr. Foster, I highly recommend that. But um, in terms of my question, I want to ask about international law, and I don't know to the extent that you may be able to answer this, but what role do you think? post-1948 international law played in legitimizing Israel's actions and the process that it took, because we talk about genocide and, well, you know, whenever the discussion comes on, when does this end, when does international law, when do powers step in, there's always, like, there's a due process, there's a process to do this. Um, and so international law and, you know, many legal scholars, Hardy Hinson himself has discussed this in, in his book, recent book, that it's played a role in legitimizing uh, so suffering of Palestinians. So what I'm asking you, what role do you think it played in legitimizing Israel mm -hmm. uh, as a nation state, as an ethnic nation state? Yeah, I, I'm not a scholar of international law, but uh, but I I I read with great interest people who are and who speak exactly to the point you're making. That um, um, of course, I mean we're at a that because of the the definition of genocide was came out of the the Jewish experience in Europe and has been you know basically used to legitimate uh, Israel and to well more than legitimate to uh, shield it from all uh, culpability for its acts right um, but I must say just as an individual person who cares about the way the world functions. Um, you know, I have been uh, both appalled and actually frightened by the extent to which international, the, the international, international law and the sort of international rules-based order has been totally flouted uh, in, in the attack on Gaza. I mean, I find it very frightening. Is it sort of if that can happen, 
really anything can happen. It just has to do with might and power in the world and our, the talk of, of having uh, some kind of a higher minded and um, moral order in the world um, rings, is ringing very hollow at the moment for me personally, right? Um, yeah. So, and, and uh, as I mentioned, the International Court of Justice, I mean, they, they, were, they were asked to opine on, by the United Nations to, to investigate Israel's presence in, in the West Bank and Gaza. I mean, this is before the attack, the most recent attack on Gaza. And they finally issued their, in July of this year, they issued their opinion, which is really very hard hitting and basically says, is, Israel is an illegal occupier of Gaza and the West Bank and should withdraw immediately and should withdraw their set settlers immediately. I mean, do you see that? Uh, did you see this in the mainstream American press being discussed in any in any uh, meaningful way? I don't think so. So, but this is, it, I mean, this is the International Court of Justice. This is supposed to be international law. So, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Nora Arakat's book is really great on this history, like at these particular moments in 1948 and 1967, what role did the law play? And she talks, she comes and so mentioned the very specific legal arguments. She talks about how Palestine was kind of framed as an exception. Mm -hmm. and, and, and because the system was so, is so state centric, the minute everyone recognized Israel as a state, Israel had an upper hand in this mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. But she goes into great detail and she also like, points to some moments in which there was some challenge to that status. And I highly recommend her book if you're interested in it for the next. Um, Justice yeah, I should remind you that we have this resource list outside for those of you who came in later. If you didn't pick it up, <clears throat> you can pick it up on the way. Um, I've got a couple of comments in it, but maybe thank you that I learned a lot. Um, one of my comments is what you're saying about the International Court of Justice. I mean, this is not the initial court. This is not the first time that they've done something with respect to the foreign policy that the U.S. just seems to ignore and so the rest of the world. Um, and, you know, as preposterous as the stuff that you're talking about, just, I'm floored by the fact that we can uh, stop the war for two days so we can vaccinate some children against polio and then, you know, start bombing two days later so that um, they won't die from polio, but they will have, you know, it's ludicrous to me. Um, but I'm interested in, in what you mentioned and something I've often been curious about, um, which is um, after World War II was over and, and uh, Jews and others were in concentration camps, they didn't want to stay in Germany, you know, of course, of Europe, fascist Europe, for obvious reasons, were time and time again rejected to come to various parts of, of the rest of the world. Um, and I, I think a lot about that because uh, the, my grandparents were allowed to leave uh, Nazi Germany at that time. They were welcome to the United States, and many of their friends were. Um, and they did not embrace this idea of Zionism or a Jewish state when they left. They kind of became very American. But um, I know from them that um, many people went uh, to what was now being called Israel or to what we like to call Palestine because it was the only option for them. And they wouldn't have become Zionists or they wouldn't have become part of the Israeli state had there been other areas around the world. And I, I haven't heard that spoken very much. I just want that a flag and brought that up because that's something that I, I'm trying to understand more. Because mm -hmm. we sort of forced them into that because um, right. there were no other options. Right. Um, I think we also had questions here and here. I think we could start there. Yeah. Um, I just thought it was really fascinating to, uh, I thought it was really fascinating that you brought up the fact that, um, like, as a lot of people wouldn't know that, you know, Zionist settlement did not start in the 20th, or the Jewish settlement did not start in the 20th, 20th century, but, you know, there are, um, uh, religious and agricultural settlements that started in the historical Palestine in the 19th century. And I was just curious of sort of what would that dynamic, what that dynamic was and how the Ottoman and how the Ottoman Empire dealt with these settlers that were basically a sort of disruption to the sovereignty of the Ottoman Empire as a state. Mm -hmm. I, um, yeah, I may have to 
bounce this question to Mustafa, who I think knows more about this than I do. But I was going to say I, I, one one point I would make is that you know the, the 19th century uh, settlements were not that successful, right? Actually, a lot of people a lot of people left. Um, they didn't they didn't really they didn't really take off, and they never attracted large numbers of of Jews. Um, I mean, it was it was the beginning of what was, would become a, a more significant project, but it wasn't very successful in that period. And I think the you know they did try to deal with the Ottoman the Ottomans I, as I as I, I think, and I'm but I'm going to let ask mm -hmm. Professor Oxical to speak to this. Ran a little bit hot and cold on the subject. I mean, they they were not necessarily all that enthusiastic, but. Yeah, I don't need to add much to that. The Ottoman state was concerned about the number about uh, immigration from Europe. The numbers were still relatively low. Uh, but the Ottoman state also tried to restrict immigration because it could see some of the problems that were developed in, uh, in Palestine. Um, one of the things that European Jews could do was under the capitulation, actually settle in Palestine without, necessar without necessarily um, having um, uh, being required to take on acquire Ottoman citizenship, for example, which was uh, what is the normal procedure for anyone settling in the Ottoman Empire. So mm -hmm. there were capitulatory or extraterritorial rights that they could take advantage of and settle in Palestine uh, or overstay their visa as, as people do that uh, mm -hmm. in other parts of the world too. Mm -hmm. Which I guess is the reason why we we don't have good statistics on the, the numbers. Really, they're always estimated. Yeah. 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 Um, just connecting to the comment from the back, I want to ask: Is there a longer historical trajectory to what we see now as this equation between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism? Yeah. I mean, I, I okay. Talking from personal experience, I've never seen it the the way it is now to the to this extent. I have not seen uh, you know this and that the way it is being systematically used as a way to forestall or silence uh, criticism of Israel. I I, I mean, I, I've heard it. I, I, so so I'm saying okay. So I've been what. 50 years, more or less, um, following this uh, situation. And I've certainly, um, uh, that's a really interesting question. I'm trying to, I'm trying to think, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to think. I, I've never seen it like this. You know, what's the, is there a deeper history of it? Uh, well, I'm sure there is, of course. I mean, I think the Palestinians themselves were sort of like, oh, you know, the reason you're not, you're, you're giving us a hard time is because you are anti-Semites, right? Um, but uh, the way it has been weaponized today, I think is, is it's not, it's, it's not new, but it's the, the level is unprecedented. But I would, you know, ask other other colleagues here, of other people here. And I want to add that we've always been trying to scapegoat somebody so we believe in unions, therefore you're a communist, you know, and, and we always try to, to criticize somebody for their beliefs. And I think that anti Semitism in Israel is real, not Israel, but it's real. And then, but it's so easy to use that as an excuse for uh, uh, talking about what we can't talk about Palestinian liberation. Um, and that is a really, I mean, as a Jew, that's a really sad state of affairs because it really goes against what we are taught to believe in. Um, so it's like all the religions are taught, but I think it's being used um, very inappropriately politically now. I think the thing that is somewhat encouraging is that there are a number of Jewish organizations that are addressing this and really looking at. And Judaism exists all around the world. It does, you don't have to have Israel. Judaism exists. I've traveled all over Latin America and met Jews in you know Chile and, and Argentina and Nicaragua. And, and so I think that that's uh, one small light of um, positivity and that people show that Judaism can exist without the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, so one kind of, I have kind of two questions. First one is I'm curious about like how, um, how like Palestinians and Arabs 
view the time period of, of the Ottoman Empire. Um, this summer, I had a study abroad in Jordan, and when I talked to people who lived there, they all had different opinions mm -hmm. on the Ottomans, mm -hmm. ranging from like better to have like 300 year, more years under Ottoman dominion than 30 years under the British rule, uh -huh. to like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, everyone like, to like, oh, the Turks, they were like really oppressive and they just wanted to suppress our culture and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you read, it's a very interesting question. With historians, it's quite fascinating to see how historical narratives change and evolve over time, right? But certainly, I think there was a very strong uh, 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 strand of Arab nationalist historiography that viewed the Ottomans as just like, you know, 400 years of oppression, right? And uh, as this benighted period and this dark ages and so forth. And it was only when we liberated ourselves from Ottoman rule that we were able to, um, uh, you know, reclaim our own identity and our future. Um, it, it's a narrative that arises very, very, I mean, in, in very modern times in the 20th century. And I would say, um, you know, it, it, uh, it's been interesting to me to see how it has changed over time and been, as you say, now there's a much greater diversity of opinion. I mean, if you went to the Arab world, I would say 50 years ago, they, that's all you would hear is that the Ottomans, it was a benighted, terribly oppressive time. Now it's a much more nuanced situation. I think, you know, there are Arab historians who have really um, taken a different and look at the Ottoman Empire and even see it as, you know, as kind of a, you know, somewhat idyllic or, or at least preferable to what's going on today, sort of sense, right? Um, so, and, and that also is connected somewhat to um, Islamist currents and the fact that, you know, uh, you know being together as an as a Islamic empire seems preferable to being to, to what we have today. Um, yeah, so it, it's, it's been interesting to see the historiography shift and change, although the, that this sort of Arab historiography, anti-Ottoman Arab historiography strand is still alive and well in some circles. Yeah, yeah. In Turkey too, actually, just the same thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. um, my second question is like, if the removal of the Palestinians and the enforcing them to like countries like Egypt and Jordan is like completed, what predictions do you have for the Middle East as in the future? Because I did take a like little like lesson on this and they said that like the professor at montana this was at montana university he said that um that it could possibly like destabilize the middle east overall because um the countries like egypt and jordan don't have the like, resources or anything to like take in so many people yeah. and, and they certainly understand that very well themselves right so they have you know very little interest egypt certainly has placed so many barriers to Palestinian entry or integration and Jordan the same. I mean, they, they, yeah. So, um, I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't have a, you know, a crystal ball here. So I don't know what would be, if, if Israel was successful in its in ethnic cleansing to a degree, to a greater degree than it has been so far. I'm not, I, I, I don't know what, what would happen. I mean, um, you know, but certainly neither Jordan nor Egypt have any interest in finding out. Just a very small comment, just to, on the uh, the anti like Ottoman narrative uh, is that it's very institutionalized in like schooling and in textbooks and in university education. Therefore, like it takes. Mm -hmm. It takes a lifetime for someone to gain knowledge outside of that like state very um sponsored narrative and that's in the case of jordan specifically um and i think that often times now uh the revisions to that narrative or the multiplicity of opinions perhaps is very inspired of what the what Turkey is today, not really as much of like really revisiting history in at least my opinion. But I have a question and I'm not sure like if you would like to speak about it more uh, outside of this and it's uh, on your, you're, you're focused on the British mandate time of Palestine. 
And I'm curious to like learn more a little bit about how there was a shift in like this from Arabness to Palestinianness or Palestinianism slowly. So do you have like examples that you think are interesting for us to navigate or because I think it is the case of Palestine specifically that the this the national project was that started and was in, um, envisioned at that specific time differently mm -hmm. from others across very inspired by your question. Uh, so like if you could say something a little bit more about like how it was an Arab revolt or perhaps an anti-colonial Arab revolution at first, but then slowly became this like national dream, I guess, or a dream of a national state. Yeah, right, right. Um, I'm not sure I have a, a, very much to say about it. I mean, I, I do think that certainly, you know, like the great the great revolt was, I mean, it was against the British primarily, but it was to establish, uh, it was very Palestinian in its uh, in its rhetoric and in its uh, aims, right? It was for the liberation of Palestine, right? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think you've always had, I mean, having said that, I think there have always been different political currents within that part of the region, within that part of the Arab world. I mean, you know, some people have never given up the dream of a great Arab, of a big Arab state, right? I mean, that, that dream still exists, right? Um, so, uh, you know, particularistic nationalisms, um, they always were in contention with other visions, I think, of what a, a good political future would be or what, what the best political future would be. Um, yeah, or Greater Syria, for example, you know, the, the different political factions. Um, but I do think what we've seen over time, certainly in the Palestine case, is a very, uh, is a clear, much clearer focus on a Palestinian, a specific Palestinian identity and, and a Palestinian nationalist identity and a need for Palestinian self-determination as a community. Right. Yeah. Did you still have a question? Sorry, any more? Oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. So I'm just thinking about, you know, institutionalized knowledge, which and we talked a little bit about the role of international law. Um, I'm also thinking about the role of the academy, academia, particularly in the U.S., and this mm -hmm. goes back to very common about Zionism and how Zionism is being taken out today or defined today mm -hmm. and how it has been historically. Um, and like um, now, the way that Israel's violences are legitimized, for example, we're talking about Zionism here in this classroom as part of a, as a political movement, as an ethno-nationalism, whereas universities like NYU last week made Zionism a legitimate protected class identity category, protected class. So how do we reconcile those different kind of terminologies across these different spaces in which Knowledge is shared, yes, but also knowledge is produced. Right, right. Well, one thing that's been very interesting to me is is the kind of the disconnect between the scholars in universities who actually work on the Middle East, right, and the administrations in universities at the moment. So, um, you know, I mean, you take the Middle East Studies Association, for example, which is the academic association that represents. Uh, scholars of the Middle East region um, in in this country in North America, and you know there there is uh, a lot of clarity within that, or in a lot of very grave concern about, in that organization about what's happening in Gaza and the issues of scholasticide uh, in the in Gaza and so forth, and and also a lot of clarity I think about the refusal to. Uh, um, equate uh, Judaism with Zionism or, uh, you know, pro-Palestinianism with anti-Semitism. Um, so, but the university, uh, the, you know, the university administrations, and including our own here, are, are um, susceptible to other kinds of pressures and forces. I mean, they're certainly not consulting with Middle East schol with scholars of the region as to how to think about these things, unfortunately. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. For that, you want to just add to that, which I know you, you both know, right? There are groups actively working to blur the distinction between mm -hmm. right? I mean, this is the agenda of many organizations in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. that are funded sometimes directly by Israel, sometimes not. Mm -hmm. um, and and this is like, I think when I was thinking about the earlier question about the history of this, why did these become equated? I think there's been a lot of work to make this equation, right? Mm -hmm. Especially post 1960s, right? To characterize Palestinians as terrorists. Mm -hmm. There's this great report that was done by Palestine legal and Daryl Lee about anti-terror laws in the U.S. and how they came out. They were specifically targeting mm -hmm. Palestinians, and the U.S. government was lobbied by groups like the ADL. To mm -hmm. pass le legislation like this in the late 1960s. And the ADL is one of these groups that's actively working to equate anti Semitism and critique of Israel. And is considered a mainstream civil rights organization in the US and has an open invitation to talk to university presidents all around the country. No. And yeah, so there's been a lot of work put into this. And yes. Just adding that, then then you have um, the groups that are funding politicians, even some Democrats against other Democrats, like what happened to Cory Bush in you know, in Missouri, yeah. where uh, uh, somebody who was advocating for ceasefire um, and pro Palestinian was lost out in the primary because she was funded. The opponent was funded by APEC, and so you know we see it not only through the ADL, but the uh, um, but these huge lobbying groups that are picking and choosing politicians who are making foreign policy decisions. Um, so we actually I don't want to get into it. You know, I think, you know, yeah, I think, I think we, we, you know, we're a little bit over our planned time. So, but I want to thank you all for coming and so.